Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ahmed Zia Abdelwahab. I'm a diagnostic and interventional radiologist. Today, we are going to talk about bone tumors. Uh, bone tumors are a wide variety of lesions that happens almost everywhere in all bones. Uh, they are difficult to diagnose, difficult to interpret, and the most difficult thing is to decide what kind of a tumor is that. So, over the next few weeks, we will have several sessions and uh, several talks about the musculoskeletal system in general. We will have a session on the bone tumors and on the radiolucent bone lesions, uh, a session on the shoulder joint and the uh, knee joint, and some interpretation sessions. So, uh, I would recommend that anyone who needs a further review of the musculoskeletal system or he feels that... Uh, it's not his strongest uh, area in, in radiology to follow us and uh, to attend our lectures at Resgari Teaching Hospital and to uh, review our lectures on, the, uh, on our YouTube channels. First, regarding bone tumors, uh, if we uh, come to, the, to real practice, when it comes to real practice, Bone tumors, almost all of them, they look alike. If, the, if you don't know what to look for, what uh, might help you to decide which kind of a tumor uh, is this, so uh, it will be a very difficult job to you. So you need to know what to look for and what are the criteria that helps to decide whether this is a tumor is benign or this tumor is malignant and so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, the rule number one, that you must follow in order to have a very good interpretation of bone tumors is never, ever interpret a bone lesion without having an X-ray. You do not interpret MRI of bone lesion or CT scan or even ultrasound without first having an X-ray. X-ray is the most important and most useful diagnostic tool for the bone, uh, for to uh, the evaluation of bone tumors. So, uh, what are we looking for in the, uh, if we have a bone lesion? First, we are looking for clues. Clues that uh, we might might help us uh, are the clues of the appearance of the lesion, the location of the lesion, the density of the lesion, and other clues. Other clues, for example, a soft tissue component. There is a soft tissue component of the lesion might help you. So, uh, we will talk about these clues one by one. Uh, regarding the appearance of the lesion, um, there are different types of uh, the appearance of the lesion. First, you need to look for the patterns of the bone destruction, the periosteal reactions. There are different types of periosteal reactions. We'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, you need to look for the tumor matrix. What we mean by tumor matrix is that what is the tumor composed of? What it, what's the substance of a tumor? What is it? and you need to look for the expensile nature of the lesion. First, the patterns of bone destruction. Good patterns of bone destruction can be categorized into three different types. First, there is geographical bone destruction, moth-eaten bone destruction, and permeative kind of bone destruction. Regarding the geographical bone destruction, what do we mean by geographical bone destruction is that the lesion is sharply defined. If I draw a line on the outline of the lesion and you draw a line on the outline of the lesion, our lines will match, will be exactly the same. That's what we mean by geographical bone destruction. Uh, the borders are well defined and there is a narrow zone of transition. What it means, it means that there is a, a less aggressive, more slowly growing, and mostly it's some sort of more likely to be a benign bone lesion that's having a geographical kind of bone destruction. For example, you see here, this lesion here, it's uh, a non-ossifying fibroma. It's a benign bone lesion, of course. Uh, you can see this, a very narrow zone of transition. It's extremely well defined. If you can see here, this part that's encircled in red, you can see it's very sharp. It's well defined. If when I draw it, of course, if you draw it, it, our lines will be the same. This is what we mean by geographical type of bone destruction. So, if we see a lesion that is uh, geographical in nature, what it might be? The top three differentials uh, you might keep in mind are non-ossifying fibroma, 
chondral amyxoid fibroma, and eosinophilic granuloma. Now, for the second part of the bond, uh, for the second type of the bond destruction, we have the moth-eaten type of bond destruction. With, what we mean by that is that there is areas of destruction with ragged borders. The borders are ill-defined, are not sharply defined. We do not, we will not agree on the extent of the tumor. If I draw it and you draw it, most of the times our lines will not match. What this means, it means aggressive kind of tumor, most likely a malignant tumor. So, uh, for example, you can see at this image here, this is a case of multiple myeloma. You can see the whole bone is moth-eaten. There are multiple holes, uh, multiple areas of radiolucency all over the bone, here and there and there and there, in the, even in the acromion process, in the head of the humerus. The whole thing is rooted. It's not... Uh, it's well defined. It's it looks like you ill defined. Okay, so this implies a very aggressive kind of bone tumor. What are the top candidates for this kind of bone destruction? We have four candidates. Uh, first, uh, we have the myeloma, multiple myeloma, metastasis, lymphoma, and in young patients, teens and early twenties, always keep in mind soft tissue sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcoma. It's a common tumor that you need to keep it in mind. Having sarcoma. The third type of bone destruction is permeative pattern of bone destruction. What do we mean by permeative is that the, uh, the tumor has an ill-defined with multiple wormholes and spread through the marrow space. The tumor is spreading through the inside of the bone, not on the cortex, not on the outside. It's in the medullary cavity. It's in the inside of the bone. And of course, it will have a, a wide zone of transition. We will not agree on the uh, edges of the tumor, on the extent of the tumor. And of course, this implies an aggressive malignancy. Uh, round cell tumor, for example, multiple myeloma and uh, Ewing sarcoma and things like that. For example, you can see here, you see this bone, the medullary cavity is abnormal, it's eroded, it's, uh, it has multiple uh, lucencies, multiple linear-like lucencies, warm holes. It's like a worm is crawling inside the bone. This is a permeative kind of bone destruction. What are the tumors that more commonly, this is a case of leukemia, of course, and what are the tumors that most commonly may uh, produce a permeative kind of bone destruction? We have lymphoma, leukemia, and of course, round cell tumors like Ewing sarcoma and myeloma. Osteomyelitis might cause some permeative kind of bone destruction, Although it is not a tumor, it's an infection of the bone, but you should keep it in mind. That's where clinical history might be helpful. And neuroblastoma also causes a permeative kind of bone destruction. So overall, as a summary, you can see that the bone tumors can be geographical, can be moth-eating, and can be permeative kind of bone destruction. And this will points from less malignant to more malignant kind of uh, bone tumors. Regarding the periosteal reaction, the second clue that you need to look for, we have two types of periosteal reaction, benign type and more aggressive or malignant type of bone destruction. The benign types includes no periosteal reaction at all or solid type of periosteal reaction. While the more aggressive parts uh, of uh, bone destruction are laminated or onion peel, the sunburst part and the codman's triangle. So, regarding the benign type of bone destruction, first we have no bone destruction. Uh, sorry, regarding the benign type of periosteal reaction, first we have no periosteal reaction. As in the previous case, we see the non ossifying fibroma. You can see here, this is the lesion. It's sharply defined. There's a neural zone of transition, the geographical part, the geographical type of bone destruction. However, if you look at the edges of the bone, there is absolutely no periosteal reaction. This is an indicator of benignity of the lesion. The lesion is benign, okay? No periosteal reaction. The second kind of, periost of benign periosteal reaction is a solid type of periosteal reaction. You can see here, this is a case of chronic osteomyelitis, and you can see this kind of bone uh, of periosteal reaction here. It's one layer. It's solid. It's not interrupted. You can follow it up. Also, you can see it here in the lateral view, okay? You can see this is a solid type of 
periosteal reaction. It's not interrupted. It's continuous all over the bone. This indicates benignity of the lesion. It's a benign type of periosteal reaction. Now regarding the aggressive or malignant types of periosteal reaction, first we will start with, we will start with the onion peel pattern. Onion peel uh, kind of periosteal reaction, you can see it here. It's a layer, following a layer. Okay, and there is another layer. It's just like an onion. It's multiple layers of periosteal reaction. Again, here you can see multiple layers of bone destruction. Uh, this indicates an aggressive lesion. Most commonly, we see it in Ewing sarcoma. Okay, uh, regarding the sunburst pattern of periosteal reaction, it's just like a rays of sun radiating from the tumor, like here, here, and here, and here. It might not be so prominent like the onion peel. However, it's an indication of uh, malignancy of the lesion. It's aggressive lesion causing this sunburst kind of periosteal reaction. Okay. Uh, the, regarding the Codman's triangle, it's a type of periosteal reaction that is almost always indication of malignant lesion. You can see here, this is an osteosarcoma in the distal femur. It's in the metaphysis, metadiaphysis of the distal femur. You can see there is a, some, uh, there is a sclerotic abnormality of the bone. There is an all-defined margin, wide, narrow, uh, wide zone of transition. Uh, you cannot define the tumor exactly. Uh, you can see periosteal reaction here. It's interrupted in this part. And if you notice here, there is a triangle. This one here. I'm not a very good painter, unfortunately, but I think we can agree that there is a kind of uh, triangular type of, bone, of periosteal reaction here. Also, you can see it here. Okay, this interrupted periosteal reaction with Coldman's triangle on the edges are highly likely to be a malignant lesion. This is an aggressive type of, malign uh, of periosteal reaction. You can see the whole spectrum of the periosteal reaction from the solid sunburst to onion peel and the Coldman's triangle here. Now, the next clue that we should look for is the tumor matrix. Tumor matrix can be either osteoblastic or cartilaginous. Osteoblastic uh, are described in different terms like fluffy, cotton-like, cloud-like densities, as you see in osteosarcoma. Uh, cartilaginous type of uh, tumor matrix uh, have different kinds of calcifications. We will talk about them in a, in a minute. So, regarding the osteoblastic kind of, pre, uh, of uh, tumor matrix, uh, this is a case of an uh, osteosarcoma, and you can see this is a dense, ill-defined lesion involving the bony pelvis. Uh, the tumor matrix are dense, even here in the ischium, it's involved here. The, the, it's dense, it's sclerotic, it's blastic. Blastic means forming bone. Osteoblastic means bone forming tumor. It's heavily calcified. So there is a blastic kind, osteoblastic kind of bone uh, formation of tumor. Regarding the cartilaginous type of uh, tumor matrix, uh, have many uh, kinds of descriptions. They sometimes called comma shape. Punctate, annular, popcorn-like, like in chondromas, chondrosarcomas, chondromyxoid fibromas. And in this case of chondrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, by the way, is a low-grade malignancy. It's a malignant tumor, but it's not very aggressive. So it's much better prognosis than osteosarcoma, for example. Chondrosarcoma here, you can see there is an interruption of the cortex of the bone. Okay, there is a small or slight periosteal reaction because it's a low grade malignant tumor. The tumor is a little bit lytic, uh, not very well defined. You cannot agree on the edges of the tumor. It's some, some way, somewhere here. And you can see the type of calcification within the tumor matrix. The tumor matrix has a scattered uh, calcific foci here and there. It's popcorn-like, uh, comma-shaped, fluffy kind of uh, calcifications within the tumor matrix. So, these are the kinds of clues that to look for in the tumor matrix. Now, regarding the expensile lesions of the bones, what are the lesions that might cause bone 
expansion. Uh, the most common ones are multiple myeloma, metastasis, brown tumor, although brown tumor is not a real tumor, it's not a neoplastic process, but it's a misnomer, but we will include it because it might look like a tumor and, it's, uh, and it is expensile. In chondromas, aneurysmal bone cysts, and fibrous dysplasias, all of them are expensile lesions of the bone. First, let's start with multiple myeloma. You can see here, there is a lesion here in the uh, rib that is expanding the rib. It's, the rib is not, uh, it's not the same. It changes the shape. It's expanding. Uh, there is something pushing it, making it, uh, it larger than the other normal rib, like this rib, for example. So, regarding metastasis, this is a metastasis from renal cell carcinoma, and you can see the bone is completely destructed, okay? There is this lesion here that is lytic, and it's obviously expanding the iliac crest and resulting in bone expansion to the outside. This was a case of metastasis. Regarding a brown tumor, brown tumor, as we said, it's not uh, a real tumor. It's uh, some uh, pathology related to hyperparathyroidism. You can see the tumor here. It's sharply defined, okay, and it's lytic, and it's expanding the bone. Why we included the image of the phalanges here? You can see there is uh, evidence of lace-like pattern within the phalanges, and there is subperiosteal re uh, resorption. You can see it here and here. It's very subtle. Subperiosteal resorption indicating hyperparathyroidism. Inchondromas are quite common. We see it a lot in our daily practice. And there are benign lesions of no uh, malignant potential. You can see here it's medullary. It's well defined, well circumscribed here. Okay. And you can see there is this comma shaped kind of tumor matrix of calcification within the tumor matrix. It's expensile, changing the shape of the bone, expanding it to the outside, uh, indicating these are all findings characteristics of inchondroma. Regarding aneurysmal bone cyst, aneurysmal bone cysts uh, have very different locations. In this case, if you notice, these are two pedicles of the vertebra. Again, two pedicles here and two pedicles here. And when you reach this uh, L4 vertebra, you can see there is one pedicle here. However, there is no pedicle here. There is a lesion. It appears some sort of slightly increased soft tissue density lesion involving the pedicle and the body on the left side of the vertebra, and it's expanding outside. So uh, this uh, has a wide differential diagnosis. However, this was an aneurysmal bone So when interpreting uh, x-rays always take a careful look on the pedicles for the lumbar spine or for the cervical spine look for the pedicles sometimes you might find a missing pedicle which might indicate further investigations fibrous dysplasia is just this plastic process involving the whole bone the bone is of course widened you can see here and uh, it's an abnormal shape the it's a Benign process, however, it's an expensile bone lesion. Regarding the location of the lesion, you need to consider the following. First, the location of the lesion in the transverse plane. Is it cortical? Is it medullary? And is it central? Is it eccentric? You need to evaluate it in the longitudinal plane. Is it epiphyseal, metaphyseal? Diaphyseal, diametaphyseal, where is it located exactly? Uh, there are the, the tumors, most of them have a usually characteristic locations. Uh, and you need to consider which body part that is involved. For example, is it a pelvic lesion? Is it a rib lesion? Is it a lesion involving the spine? So you need to look for clues on regarding the location of the lesions. In this diagram here, you can see there is a whole differential diagnosis regarding the location of the lesion within the bone, uh, whether it's central or eccentric. You can see, for example, giant cell tumor here. It's usually about the articular surface of the bone. It's epiphyseal, while simple bone cysts are more commonly to be metaphyseal, 
and so on and so forth. For example, osteodosteoma, usually the physical, cortical, eccentric, and things like that. So you need to consider the location of the lesion. Like we uh, all uh, know when you're opening a new project or you are, when you're buying a home or we're doing any business, the rule, the first rule is location, location, location. So you need to evaluate the location in the axial and uh, in the axial and sagittal or coronal plane, in the longitudinal plane. You need to evaluate the location in terms of where is it in the bone? Is it epiphyseal, metaphyseal, diaphyseal, diametaphyseal? Is it centric? Is it eccentric? And where exactly in the body? Is it pelvic? Is it rib? Is it a vertebral lesion? All of these need to be considered before reaching a good differential diagnosis. So, in the longitudinal plane, what are the tumors that are usually the most common tumors that are uh, in the epiphysis? or epiphyseal location, they are the giant cell tumors and the chondroblastomas. While in the metaphyseal region, look for osteomyelitis, osteo, and chondrosarcoma. In the diaphysis, look for round cell lesions like Ewing sarcoma, for aneurysmal bone cyst, and for inchondromas. The, for example here, you can see uh, the location of the lesion is, as we said, characteristic for many of the lesions. For example, this is a simple bone cyst. You can see the lesion is metaphyseal, it's expansile, it's well defined, very well defined, indicating a benign lesion or less aggressive lesion. And there is some sort of a fracture here. This is what we call the fallen fragment sign. All of these indicates uh, a simple bone cyst. In addition, if you notice, the, uh, the growth plate is not fused yet, indicating a young age patient which is also another characteristic for simple bone cyst. Uh, another lesion that is uh, epiphyseal in uh, location, like we said, the uh, uh, chondroblastoma, you can see it here, it's eccentric, it does not above the articular surface, and it is very well defined. Again, here you can see it in the hip, uh, in the, sorry, in the head of the humerus, uh, sorry, in the head of the femur, it's very well defined, it, uh, is a sharp zone of transition. It has an epiphyseal location, which is characteristic for chondroblastoma. Uh, regarding giant cell tumor, giant cell tumor is most commonly seen after closure of the growth plate. You can see the growth plate is completely and totally closed here, indicating an adult patient. And you can see it's a lytic lesion here. It's a lytic lesion that is in contact with the articular surface of the a joint okay it's about it abuts the articular surface and it's a little bit expensile here you can see it uh, indicating that this is uh, a giant cell tumor now, regarding adamantinoma the most common location of adamantinoma as we all know it's the uh, tibia you can see here some sort of lytic lesion it has variable uh, content there is an expansion of the bone here it's a little bit widened bone, indicating that this is uh, an, most likely to be an adamantinoma. Of course, there are some other differential diagnoses like osteomyelitis, but in this case, there is, it was an adamantinoma. Hordoma, it's a very characteristic lesion. It occurs in elderly patients, almost always elderly patients. It involves the clivus and the sacrum or sacrococcygeal area. You can see here, this is the border of the sacrum on the left side here. And when you draw it on the other side, you reach here and it's missing. There is nothing here. There is some sort of a lesion destroying the sacrum. This lesion here, in an elderly patient, it's highly suggestive of a cordon. Regarding osteoblastoma, osteoblastoma occurs in the spine and it's in the posterior element uh, again you can see there is a pedicle here and a pedicle here you can see a pedicle here and a pedicle here and when you come here you see a pedicle and there is nothing here there is a sclerotic lesion that is osteoblastic kind of tumor okay this indicates an osteoblastoma it's this is it's a characteristic location for for osteoblastoma in younger age group. So, regarding the clues by the density of the lesion, you should 
look for evidence of sclero sclerotic cortical lesion or uh, lytic lesions in uh, children or in adults. It differs. Plastic lesions in children and in adults also there is a, a wide difference. For example, uh, sclerotic cortical lesions. The most the famous one is the osteoblasto uh, osteoosteoma. Sorry. The osteoosteoma. Osteoosteoma characteristically presents with pain that are more at night, relieved by aspirin and other non-steroidals. Uh, there is a lytic focus, nidus, cortically based, eccentric within the diaphysis. Okay, and there is a characteristic uh, thickening, cortical thickening surrounding it. And on MRI, of course, I, I think you all know that the nidus will be hyper intense on T2 weighted. Fat, uh, on T2-weighted images and fat, T2 fat-saturated images uh, indicating an osteoid osteoma. Brody's abscess is a sort of an osteomyelitis uh, that the abscess become isolated from the surrounding, surround, uh, it appears as a lytic lesion and surrounded by a sclerotic bone reaction. Regarding lytic lesions in children, if it is solitary, like this one here, most likely it is an eosinophilic granuloma or EG. Okay, it's very well defined, punched out lesion with beveled edges. More common to be eosinophilic granuloma. If there are multiple punched out lesion, views all over most uh, of the skull. For example, in this skull X-ray, all of the skull bones are involved with multiple lytic lesions. For example, like this one here, and this one, this one, this one, and this one. Uh, these are a more aggressive type of uh, lesions. Uh, in this case, it was a leukemia. Regarding metastatic lesions that result in lytic lesions in adults, keep in mind uh, lung, renal, and thyroid. Lung, renal, and thyroid tumors are more commonly to cause uh, lytic bone lesions in adults. For example, in this case of metastatic thyroid carcinoma, you can see a lytic lesion here, and you can see a lytic lesion here uh, on the pelvis. And if you compare both sides, there is some sort of lytic lesion uh, due to thyroid metastasis. Again, multiple myeloma is a disease of the elderly. You can notice there are multiple kinds of degenerative changes with uh, narrowing of the joint space, of the hip joint space here. Uh, there are some marginal osteophytes here and there indicating it's an elderly patient. And if you look at the bone, the bone is, it, obviously it's moth eaten. There are multiple areas of lucency involving the bony pelvis, the hip uh, joint in general, both acetabular and femoral aspects of it. So this uh, indicates a uh, lytic lesion in adult that is an aggressive kind it, which was a multiple myeloma. Primary bony tumors should keep in mind. Uh, in this case, it was a chondrosarcoma. You can see if you compare the pubic bone on the right and left side, obviously this pubic bone is abnormal. It is wide, okay? It is lytic. It, there is a diffused, ill-defined, decreased bone density with bone expansion here and it was a chondrosarcoma in this case. Of course, as we said, chondrosarcoma is a disease of the, not all the adults, the elderly. What about children? Children there with plastic lesions will result in increased bone density. For example, compare this vertebra with this vertebra. You can see, obviously, there is an increased bone density here, and there is an increased bone density here. This is what we call an ivory vertebra here and there, also some sort of decreased bone density here. So these are it's a plastic or a sclerotic bone lesions. There's increased bone density. Plastic osteoblastic lesions in children, keep in mind lymphoma. Again, here you can see in adults an osteoblastic bone lesion. The most famous example is prostate carcinoma. There are multiple areas of increased bone density here, the bony pelvis here, and you can see the bony pel uh, the sacrum here. Uh, there are multiple areas, even if you compare the ischium here and there, you can see there is increased bone density here, indicating all of these bones are involved by metastasis from prostate carcinoma. Again, plastic lesions in adults, 
you can see in this it just the same example in children lymphoma resulting in an ivory vertebra or a plastic or bone uh, sclerosis of this vertebral body here and here also you can see multiple kinds of plastic lesions in the vertebra due to lymphoma budget disease um, it's uh, a disease that is uh, rare in the Mediterranean region, our region, the Middle East. Uh, it's very rare to see uh, patch disease. However, in the northern uh, the European countries, uh, it's a quite common disease. So you should keep it in mind, especially when you're having your board exams. Patch disease is one of the uh, common diseases to arise in uh, an oral or practical uh, board exam. The result in diffuse fluffy uh, plastic reaction of the bone multiple areas of increased bone density in the skull in the pelvis in the bony pelvis in the lower limbs associated with areas of decreased bone density according to the phase of the lesion it has you know different phases uh, sclerotic and lytic, mixed and lytic uh, like here and here uh, rare type of a rare cause of a uh, plastic re uh, reaction in bone in adults is fluorosis, which is uh, intoxication by fluoride. Other clues to look for are the soft tissue extension that might help us to determine whether it's a benign or malignant lesion. For example, soft tissue component, if there is a bone lesion, bone tumor, with associated with a soft tissue component, most of the times it will imply a malignant tumor and mostly it will be a highly malignant tumor and some most of the times it will result in uh, discrete uh, soft tissue mass and and usually the mass will be large like maybe larger than the primary tumor the original tumor it's big mass uh, some benign conditions that might result in soft tissue extension is osteomyelitis. However, it's not due to mass formation, not soft tissue mass. It's due to infiltration of the soft tissue surrounding the bone. It's infiltration of the fat surrounding the bone that result in a mass-like lesion. It's not a soft, real soft tissue mass. For example, you can see here. On the X-ray, there is a permeative pattern of bone destruction. The medullary cavity of the bone is not very well seen uh, it's permeative it's there are some wormholes here and there when mri is done you can see that what appears here as an increased or bulging of the soft tissue here in the mri it's very well seen that there is a big huge soft tissue mass arising from the bone extending to the adjacent soft tissues in young adults especially in teens, tumors with a large soft tissue mass almost always will be an owing sarcoma. Keep in mind, soft tissue masses, big masses in young adults are most of the times owing sarcoma. Always keep it in mind. Look for other clues to help you decide that this is an owing sarcoma or not. So, what are the criteria that help us to de decide whether the lesion is benign or lesion is malignant? First, the penile lesions will have a well-defined sclerotic border. It will, most of the times, will have uh, no soft tissue component. It will have no periosteal reaction or a solid type of periosteal reaction, like here. Okay, it will be geographical. It will show a geographical kind of bone destruction with a narrow zone of transition. While malignant lesions, they will have a per interrupted periosteal reaction. They will show us some sort of Codman's triangle here and there might show a sunburst or laminated periosteal reaction. The bone destruction will be either moth-eaten, like here, or permeative pattern of bone destruction, and it might result in a soft tissue mass, or most of the cases, a large soft tissue mass. These are the main clues to look for when you are interpreting a case of a bone lesion. You need to know all of these clues. You need to look for them carefully. Again, do not ever interrupt bone lesion without having an x-ray even in the exam if you are if you shown a ct scan or an mri of a bone tumor always ask for an x-ray 
it will give you extra credit it will show that you are a good radiologist you know what you are looking for and you will have a very good passing degree uh, now we finished our presentation for today regarding uh, how to interpret bone lesions uh, please follow us for the next week uh, and the weeks after that we will have several presentations on bone uh, pathologies uh, this uh, let's say five six presentations the next five six presentation will be dedicated to musculoskeletal system i would recommend every resident to uh, and even young radiologist to uh, follow us up in order to improve your uh, diagnostic capabilities thank you very much